I feel like a lot of people throw around the word authenticity and authentic, and I don't feel like enough people have a grounded connection with what that really means. How do we tell when we're authentic? And what I found is that time and time again, I'd be caught in these patterns of thinking, and the way out was not through thinking. The way out was through feeling. I think that the root of inauthenticity is suppression of feelings. If we're allowed to feel what we feel, uh, we are authentic. A lot of times when we focus on manners, a lot of children will say things very honestly. If somebody has a scar on their face, a child will just say, ask, what's that scar? And an adult will be like, I don't know, they might get offended. Uh -huh. <laughs> children are connected with the state of play. They're constantly playing with their environment and interacting. Adults typically are not playing. Pink Floyd said it very well when they said, we don't need no education. We don't need no thought control. My father had a, a blood clot that stopped his heart and he was in a coma. And when his intellect was incapacitated, I got to know him in a whole different way because all that was there was his being. I, I can't remember who said this, but on the path of knowledge, every day something is added. On the path of wisdom, every day something is let go of. And authenticity is like that. Welcome friends. Today, the topic of our conversation is the nuanced subject of authenticity, which usually refers to being your own self. Perhaps when we enter into this world as children, we are full of joy and we do what we feel like we want to do. But pretty soon, we might buy into slogans like don't cry or laugh too loud in public, don't rock the boat, get good education, get a job, get married, and so on. You might wonder what's wrong with this. In my own life, searching for my true self-expression, I've discovered that it's very important to know who we are and perhaps even more importantly, what we are as a function of reality. Are we a man, a woman, an animal, or even a human? For most of us, authenticity is a long, nuanced journey of self-discovery. So it gives me great pleasure today to introduce to you a dear friend of mine, Adam Bulbulia, who has written a book on this subject titled Authenticity, The Immense Power to Be Yourself, which is now also available on Amazon. Adam is a board-certified behavioral analyst and has spent nearly two decades exploring the topics of empathy, unconditional love, and human behavior. Adam is also the author of several books and is a seasoned expert in autism and has helped hundreds of developmentally disabled youth and adults. In a way, this book is a distillation of two decades of Adam's work. And one of the things that I like about this book is how Adam approaches authenticity through multiple pathways and exploring its connections with things like creativity, nature, relationships, the workplace, livelihood, leadership, death, and even the miraculous. So I hope that you'll get a hold of this book. And if you do read this book, then please leave us a review and let us know in the comments what you felt. The links for the book are in the show notes. If you don't mind, please give the channel a like and a subscribe. And let's now turn to this beautiful conversation. And so Adam, first of all, thank you for, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. So to sort of warm up and begin the conversation, um, why authenticity? It seemed like the thing to do. <laughs> and um, it, I feel like truth is something very important to me. And authenticity is a state of being in which we are connected to truth. So um, I feel like a lot of people throw around the word authenticity and authentic, and I don't feel like enough people have a grounded connection with what that really means. How do we tell when we're authentic? How do we tell when we're inauthentic? How do we tell when others are authentic and inauthentic? Uh, this has been a topic that I found I knew a lot about I didn't realize I always knew a lot about this topic. Even when I was young, mm -hmm. I could sense when people were inauthentic. I would just, I mean, I think children are a great judge of that. They don't trust people that are inauthentic often. We, we 
you can sense that animals, children can have this sense. And so I, I've always had a sort of a radar for this. Beautiful. And so sort of as I was reading your book, you know, preparing for having this conversation and uh, us being friends, you were generous enough to hand me this book and I enjoyed reading it. And one of the things was it was not a giant, giant book and, um, and it was accessible because the chapters are also kind of practical and not too long. And uh, I myself find authenticity to be sort of a nuanced subject. And what I like the approach in this book is that it seemed to approach authenticity from very many angles and perspectives. And as I was going through it, it felt that at each point there was some kind of new clarification, an aha moment, where you sort of have a GPS where you're honing in and getting closer and closer to clarity. Was this a spontaneous emergence of the style of how you how you chose to write the book? You know, it, in a lot of ways, the first three books that I've written, Nurture Being, um, Unconditional Eternal Love, A Guide to Love Everyone, and Authenticity, The Immense Power to Be Yourself, all have this, they've come from sort of principles. I just start writing the principles around the topic and that, and, and I think that Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching very strongly influenced me. And, mm. you know, in, in, in the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu comes at this concept of the Tao, of the way, from so many different angles and vantage points. And, you know, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. We start with that and, you know, free from desire, you realize the mystery. And we, we elucidate all these different perspectives on it. And so I, I find that a lot of times that style comes to me it's like, okay, authenticity is being yourself. Authenticity is connected. Authenticity is honest. Authenticity is like, if I just sort of brainstorm whatever comes to me around authenticity, that, that's the first way that this book formed is around principles. Yes, I, I really like that. As, as I was saying is when you look at the word authenticity, it's it's kind of nuanced and it's not immediately clear. Maybe to some people it might be immediately clear. But when you bring in principles of, you know, the Tao or honesty, originality, creativity, as you do in your book, then it starts to cultivate an essence of what authenticity, authenticity is. And I feel that at times could be a long process to really cultivate and develop uh, authenticity, which is paradoxical because it is, you know, being yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, it takes work. And maybe we'll dive into why that is. Uh, but maybe to begin with, something that I really enjoy is etymology or the origins of words. And reading your book, you know, spiked my interest to, to look at, well, I've used this word oftentimes, but I don't really know what the origins of the words are. And Just one, one inspiration off of what you were saying before we go into the etymology is this quote. I, I can't remember who said this, but on the path of, or maybe it's a Tao quote again, but uh, on the path of knowledge, every day something is added. On the path of wisdom, every day something is let go of. And, and authenticity is like that. It's like when we let go of whatever's preventing us from being authentic, it's what we find we are being. So in, in that sense, yeah, being authentic is, is a very easy state in a sense, but it sometimes in the way we're conditioned in our culture, we're trained to be very mental and disconnected from our natural way. Yes. Yes. I love it. I think that brings it home of that letting go. And, and that's why the spiritual journey or the path to authenticity oftentimes is a long one because you're letting go and finding out what is it that has been added, as you're saying. So it seems that the, the word authenticity is an ancient Greek word, and it refers to original principle, as you were saying, uh, and also inner authority and or self-authority. So uh, what does that invoke for you? Or is there any any meaning that you 
look at when you use the word authenticity? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think of authority and authenticity together in some way, in the authenticity as sort of a self-authority. And authority comes from author, authorship. You know, so the, the ability to write one's own life, the ability to be the decider on what is so, mm. the, the one that determines the truth. So, um, you know, I guess auto is self, right? So I, I think of being self-connected, authentic. That's one, one way of looking at it. I don't think I said it specifically in the book that way, but that's one way I see it. Yeah, I like that, actually. That is connected with the, the older Greek etymology is the self-referral. And another word that to me, as I was reading your book, that uh, was coming closer to me as how I view authenticity was enthusiasm. And uh, enthusiasm has an etymology of entheos, which is to be possessed by God. And it also is in reference to the nature, you know, the deities and the mm -hmm. animistic quality of nature, Mother Earth and Father Sky and all, all these, and to be possessed by them. To, to express them in your life. And, and one aspect I noticed in your book is you also talk about the connection of nature and our authenticity. So you said in your book that one of your missions, it seems like, is to make the world a place which works for everyone. And for that, you say that it is necessary to be authentic. Right. I look at it as uh, it's about creating cultures that work. So the two of us are in conversation. We want the culture of this interaction to work for both of us. That way it'll optimize what we create together. So you be yourself, I be myself, and then we see what, what happens as we create together. In a family culture, we want to create a, a, an environment where the mother and father or the parents or the single parent, whatever structure it is, can be themselves, and then the children can also be themselves. Now, uh, that doesn't mean we don't correct or discipline, or, you know, we, we obviously need to raise our children and uh, reinforce the behaviors we want to see and, you know, help guide them to being um, better versions of themselves. Yet, when we create a family culture that's not based on empathy, that's based on um, punishment or an excessive focus on discipline, we, we don't allow the children's feelings to be there. A world that works for everyone is, if you look at it as a family culture or a work culture, all these microcosms, we can create an environment where everyone can be themselves. Your authenticity could not interfere with my authenticity. It's just, it's like they harmonize together. It, it would be like um, your state of peace disrupting my state of peace and me saying, I need the peace, get out of my way. Like there's no, there's no competition. We're in collaboration here. In an authentic culture, it's based on mutual support of, of our own and each other's potential. So there's no, there's no need to fight for anything. Yes. So... Touching to this theme of parenting, when we are children, oftentimes children are taught manners and different things. And as you're highlighting, some of them are necessary. Um, and I, I find myself, and I want to reflect this with you, that children oftentimes are very in touch with what uh, it means for them to have their unique sense of being, what they want to express. And oftentimes, the more we ed get educated, the more we get older, uh, our sense of that enthusiasm and joy seems to diminish. Not for everyone, but for a lot of us, that seems to happen. Why, what do you think, first of all, do you, do you resonate with that? And if what are the processes that take us away from this original purposefulness? Yeah, I mean, Pink Floyd said it very well when they said, 
We don't need no education. We don't need no thought control. No dark sarcasm in the classroom. Hey, teacher, leave them kids alone. You know, that whole, that, so, um, children sometimes don't take others' feelings and others' perspectives into consideration. And essentially, a lot of parenting is about helping children to understand the effect their actions have on others. That can be done without, uh, without beating out their true nature. A lot of times when we focus on, uh, on manners, like a lot of children will say things very honestly. Like if, if, um, if somebody has a scar in their face, a child will just say, ask, what's that scar? And an adult will be like, I don't know, they might get offended. Yeah. <laughs> There's this whole like process of, I'm not sure if I should say this. And the child will just say what's true. When we stop our ch children from saying what's true, what they are experiencing, um, that discourages authenticity. When we teach them not to ask about what their interest naturally goes towards, when we teach them not to express their feelings, you know, somebody gives them a gift, they say, I don't like this. You say, no, no, no that's rude, you can't. You know, I remember uh, my mother told me the story of, I was given, um, I was given a, a shirt when I was four years old and I, I told the person, don't need it, don't want it, right? And it was like, just, it was a funny moment for my parents of just like, you know, like I didn't see the value in that shirt and I didn't want it, right? They were simply an authentic state. Now, sure, that there was a way in which to teach of how to receive a gift, even if you don't want it, you know, and it's good to honor this person is doing something kind to you. And, um, and, but sometimes we can teach people to be so kind that, you know, like, I really appreciate it. Thank you for getting me this shirt. It's not exactly my style, but I, I appreciate that you got it for me. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's a way in which we can teach our children to be courteous and respectful without conditioning them away from their inherent nature. Yes. And I feel what, what is also very interesting in these beautiful examples, and I, I love the fact that you, you give a lot, a lot of these examples in, in your book, and also with the exercises in games, that it really makes it a practical handbook in a way. And not just some principles out there, but really bringing it home. Um, you know, with the more time I spend with kids, I find how they take us immediately to our innocence. And the, the sense of curiosity, uh, for example, I'm always surprised when I see young kids, even toddlers, how their curiosity is just a natural phenomena. And I feel that the adults, as we become more and more conditioned, we are either we, we are reminded of that in a powerful way. And in some cases, we feel threatened subconsciously. And so we try to because we don't want to go return there ourselves, we try to mold the kids into sort of mannerisms and politeness and, you know, uh, don't rock the boat kind of thing. Um, and uh, then it takes, you know, once we get deconditioned, it can take a lifetime to have therapy and do this and that to make return. Uh, back to that state of innocence. Absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, children are connected with the state of play. They're constantly playing with their environment and interacting. Adults typically are not playing. You know, I, I, I've always um, been drawn to children because I feel more resonant with that approach to life through playing. A lot of times I'll just skip through the landscape or, you know, before parkour was a thing, I would find myself sort of moving, like moving in alternative ways and just like playing with the surroundings. And um, the, the Dave Matthews has this album, Under the Table and Dreaming, because it's like, like there's this uh, in La Vie et Bella, Life is Beautiful, there's this wonderful scene where the children are under the table and the adults are over the table and there's the adult world happening and the child world is, is under the table where there's all this imagination and play happening. 
And um, what you said about entheos and enthusiasm, it's like children are naturally connected with that enthusiasm, that curiosity. So for me, I've always liked being around children because they're more connected. And that was part of the reason I went into education and uh, you know ended up working with autistic and developmentally disabled youth and adults. Um, they actually don't lose that connection to their enthusiasm or their authenticity. They, you know, most people on the on the autism spectrum and with developmental disabilities stay connected to that authentic place. And it's interesting because some of my work is is actually teaching them manners so they can get by in society um, because they, you know, they might chew with their mouth open and like spit food out on the table or things like that 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 might gross other people out and you have to kind of like help them into these things, but, uh, but they're, they're very in touch with their authentic, um, their authentic state. And, and it, it seems to, I guess, to also connect it with societal norms, right? So it seems like that structure of family of bringing in politeness and mannerisms, which as I was reading your book, some of the examples are very surprising. Like, you know, as we, a lot of our emotions and feelings are sort of suppressed and we're conditioned. We yeah. might not notice it, notice it like you cannot laugh in a certain way in the public or you cannot cry. And even from culture to culture, that could be radically, radically yeah. different. Yeah, I think that the root of inauthenticity is suppression of feelings. If we're allowed to feel what we feel, uh, we are authentic. I mean, I guess you could say if you're allowed to feel what you feel and think what you think. Because thought control can factor into this. Mm-hmm. It, you know, there's an organic way that we think that sometimes culture stamps out of us. You're not supposed to think that way. You know, whatever we feel and think is okay. Actions, you know, you want to consider your actions. Some, some actions can have uh, negative ramifications on others. But no feeling that you feel will have any re- negative ramifications on another. It's the actions we take that, that impact others. And I would say that we don't have a choice in what we feel. We have a choice in how we respond to what we feel. Like, mm-hmm. it, it's kind of like, you know, I like grapes. I, don't, I didn't choose to like grapes. It's just, you know, I prefer grapes to cantaloupe. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I mean, other people might feel differently. You know what I mean? But it's just simply what is. Um, if I, you know, how I feel in response to something is simply a fact of my internal state. And when we, we, we have a lot of judgments against feel like I'm supposed to be happy and not be sad. I'm supposed to, I'm not supposed to be angry. I'm not supposed to be scared. I'm not supposed to feel lonely. Um, all these feelings are acceptable human experiences, sadness, depression, loneliness, longing, uh, heartbreak, when we embrace the negative feelings, we we find our way back to authenticity. Mm-hmm. Yes, one of the key things that I liked in your book, like a recurrent theme, is the theme of, uh, of feelings. And I think you said at one place that feelings, oftentimes you're uncomfortable because they are unknown and that they're also deep what you were saying was that thinking is more on the surface and feelings are deeper in that comparison. How have you f- discovered that difference between thought and feeling? I mean, I think, I think I, f- I first started exploring it in meditation when I started meditating in my 18, 19, 20, in that, that, those years of my life. Uh, but I, I became more conscious of it when I was studying process coaching work, this, uh, this work where I was noticing sensations in the body and exploring them and diving into them. Because I, I think a lot of people have feelings and emotions coupled together, and, and to me they're, they're very different. Like an emotion such as uh, sadness or joy, uh, the feeling is actually the sensation. It's actually the, the sort of bodily experience of that. 
And that's why it's new. I mean, we've all had joy before, but the particular kind of, the particular nuance of excitement and edginess and fun that I'm having right now in this conversation, I've never experienced before. There's a particular quality of it that I'm like, oh, it's good. Hey, like, we get to be together, like we get to meditate together, we get to, you know, be in soft medicine community together. And now this is a whole new area that we haven't done before. And there's something really pleasurable for me in that. And so the feelings themselves are like the sensations in the body. What is happening in my heart? What is happening in my stomach? What is going on inside? And those are constantly changing, like, like a river. The water is constantly moving through a different path. Yeah, I, I love that analogy. And actually, as you were speaking, it triggered in something that both of us share, which is Indian classical music, the, what they call the ragas. And um, the ragas are these notes of the major scales, the minor scales, and so many scales. And on top of that, these landscapes are built using notes that invoke uh, different uh, emotions or qualities of feelings like devotion and love and warrior. And they're associated also, as we were earlier talking about the connection with nature, they're with the time of the day and the season. And I feel like, at least for myself, um, it takes a certain quality, refinement of the quality of self-expression, creativity, and authenticity, which perhaps are all synonyms, where we can begin to, first of all, also become open to play with those feelings. Because for me, music invokes these feelings, but it's also a, a sort of a hat that you put on of, I'm going to explore a landscape. And I feel that if you do not have that openness and if the culture does not provide that context, which often as you were talking about both the culture and parenting, where that refinement of the emotional or feeling development of sensing feeling is not there, then that can trigger a lot of fear. Because as, as you were saying, feeling is such a rich and deep, really deep, uh, deep space. And um, one of my teachers actually has a quote, and then I'll like you to see if something is coming up for you, which is that he says that feelings are like kelp. The deeper stuck traumas and feelings, as we allow them to unravel, it could they could just keep coming for a while. <laughs> so I sort of like that analogy, especially when I'm working with some difficult feeling as you were pointing out that they're just primarily sensations and what's happening in the body. And often the narrative that we have around those is usually more often than not to block that exploration because we don't feel comfortable going there. Yeah, yeah. The safer, the safer we are to have the experience we're having, the more we allow ourselves to feel. And what I found is that time and time again, I'd be caught in these patterns of thinking and the way out was not through thinking. The way out was through feeling. When I could embrace what I was feeling, then the patterns of thinking would change. Wow. Yeah. And uh, the, a good example again, and you know, you could hear a certain kind of music and certain kind of thoughts, or uh, it can trigger a cascade of emotions and thoughts. So feelings, feelings seem to guide seem to be the guiding force. Absolutely. And, and when you're using music uh, a lot and we say we play music. We don't say we work, you know, and that come, it brings us back to that, that sense of play, that child-like sense of play. Well, you know, I think that uh, adult form of play is art. For me, writing is like a form of play, music, sculpture, all those things. It's like how... How do I just want to be in front of this, in this medium? Yes, and uh, interestingly, in, the, in your book, you have a chapter on authenticity and, and creativity. And to me, they're almost synonymous in a way. Absolutely. Right? The, more, the more authentic sort of we become and touch the deepest aspect of ourself, uh, the more creative we, we become. 
it's it's an, there's an individuation process to authenticity. You know, who you're meant to be and who I'm meant to be are are vastly different, and we may have a lot of commonality, but there's a unique sort of soul signature or you know unique expression of being that you embody, and so too do I. As we get in touch with that unique expression, it it naturally draws us to what we're meant to bring here, what, what is creative in us. So for me, um, you know, like uh, the, the experience of being in, in a spiritual group that turned out to be a mind control cult where I was indoctrinated to be a certain way, it actually, it actually shed more light on this authenticity because as I was coming out of that, I had to rediscover what was authentic. And it's almost like living life trying to be like the leader was a really good state of inauthenticity that that I could I could compare the two and how they felt very easily. Yes. And in, in your book you have a few big examples that sort of form the the core of your experience and where this wisdom that you're sharing is coming from that. And one of that was being part of uh, a cult for quite a number of years, which was, which you, as you came into your authentic power, you begin to see the patterns and, and leave. Um, and while I was looking at that, it reminded me of the etymology of the word culture and cult. And actually they're both connected mm-hmm. to the same root, right? Yes. And uh, interestingly, the etymology of culture and cult comes from cultivating Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, usually cultivating worship and devotion and these kind of things, which would be positive in the cult, it seemed negative. But one of the things which comes to me and to reflect this together is um, often people are like, you know, it's very provocative or taboo when when someone shares, oh, you know, or points at someone and says he's, he or she is part of a cult. But I feel like we're all are, you know, our cultures. Yeah. And that's why we have wars. Yes. I, I like to make a distinction between sort of oppressive culture and uh, liberating culture. And I think we're all e- either in one or the other, and we're in a mix of the two. And, and in a, lo- a lot of ways, I found after waking up from that cult, I found I was still in a cult because there are certain aspects of this culture that feel like indoctrinating mind control and other, other aspects that don't. Um, but the... Yeah, what is this is this culture that I'm in allowing me to be myself? Is this culture that I'm in supporting me in feeling in, in supporting me in being my natural state or is it discouraging that? Yes. I mean there are, there are cultures in in one extreme where we wouldn't be able to have this conversation and exploration, right? And uh, I like that distinction that you make that is, of course, is useful. I have seen, however, at times that when people point specifically at cults, um, it also offshores any responsibility of the culture we are in. Because maybe a cult is a, a little bit of perhaps an extreme. And the cult could also, what we call cult, could be counterculture. It could be sort of a revolution of people wanting to rebel against authoritarianism or I don't know colonialism materialism and then to label them as cult is when people do that it's they're offshoring a responsibility we don't want to be reflective and face our own trauma it's easier to scapegoat um, but yeah it's important to to look at it each uh, case by case basis yeah I uh, for me the litmus test is does this does this culture support me following my heart so does this culture support me following my truth if it does it's not a cult no matter how alternative it is no matter how counterculture it is if it supports me in being who who i am then it's a supportive community if it's indoctrinating me into a specific way of being where i have to follow a leader in a way that oppresses my self, my self individuation process, my self identity, then it starts to move into, into the cult waters. And, and there's 
great nuance required here because a lot of sincere teachers, you know, there's a, there's a teaching and you, you have to practice and you have to commit and there's ways in which you're coming into another culture. Um, and that can be very supportive and liberating or it can be very controlling. And some people will claim cult when that's not what's happening. It's simply they don't like the person who's the leader and they're having some issue come up. So we, we have to be careful about how we use the word cult and the cancel culture we live in right now. You know, people are not meant to be canceled. You know, so even for me, the, the leader of a group that I describe as a cult, like my heart is open to him and I'm ready for the day where he sees the truth about what happened here because it's not about canceling him. We all can get lost. We all can lose our way. And we want to keep an open heart, you know, the, 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 for, to me, we want to keep an open heart to everyone as best we can. Yes. And as you're mentioning this cancel culture, um, I just feel that in, in our society, we went to, or in the West, there was one extreme. And now as it's perhaps an overcompensation, and maybe at some point it will come in the middle. Yeah. Uh, but it's just, for now, it's just gotten on the, on the other side where... Anybody who just has an opinion that might seem radically different than ours, we just have to disconnect from them. But in fact, to create harmony, we have to connect and be able to look at all views and feelings yeah. to, to, to harmonize rather than just, you know, the ex extreme of point of view is war. You know, that's the only yeah. way people take them. For me, we can, when we disagree with empathy then we're not at war. When we dis disagree without empathy, we, we start the seeds of war. Like we may have two different views on authenticity or two different views on whatever. They can both coexist. It's not a problem. But when I say, no, yours is wrong and mine is right. And I don't relate empathically to where you're... Like, like actually in, in our conversation about cults and culture, right? I could feel there's places where we overlap and there's places where we might disagree, right? And But we're not, neither one of us has a problem with the other holding a different perspective on that. So we can collaborate and coexist and have diversity of opinion and learn from each other. But if, if I was like coming from, you know, trauma and took offense to you saying this, like, how could you say certain things aren't a cult, cults are wrong, cults are bad, and blah, blah, blah. you know, like if I came in with this perspective, perspective from my trauma and I shut down your point of view, I would be now engaging in a mind control process and telling you what you were allowed to think and believe. Yeah, it's a tyranny. Yes, exactly, <laughs> yes. Uh, something that just came to me uh, which I would like to mention is gypsies. Uh, in in many cultures uh, in the in, in India and I know in the in the Middle East and stuff, they they, you know, gypsies have this reputation. They're not considered a cult per se, in the extreme, There's, but they're on the fringe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, and uh, some families might want to protect their children from the influence of the more federal nature of the gypsies of playing the flute you know the classical musician would say oh you know this is this is a little uh, non-classical not too refined yeah but people have different and it's very interesting culture they they have you know just i think in the west it's like vagabonds and uh but i've come to appreciate them more i think they have something original and new to to teach Absolutely. You, we can learn a lot from the people that aren't conforming to the social norms that we're living by. And whether that's the, you know, the homeless person that lives a block away from you or, or stays in that area or a gypsy or uh, somebody from a different culture, simply, you know, it, it, we can learn a lot if we take the time to get to know them. Yeah. Another thing that perhaps we should touch on is... Uh, as you were talking about kids, you know, why are manners and politeness and other forms of not dropping the boat starts to get indoctrinated at the level of the family and then the culture, civilization, and so on and so forth. 
if I were to answer that, I would say that it is survival. The tendency, humans or any perhaps species, particularly humans, we have uh, one aspect of us that wants to survive and another aspect of us that wants to flourish and enter into the mysterious and the unknown. And uh, Always our, a lot of our heroes or astronauts, cosmonauts, psychonauts would be would be those, uh, and even counterculture movements, Burning Man, where where they enter into the unknown, and it's I think there's always they, they are somewhat competing forces, and I think when we become all about survival, then authenticity uh, doesn't do very well. Do you have any any thoughts as to what kind of forces? Well, fear discourages authenticity. And mm-hmm. so when we're in survival mode, we're, we're scared, you know, typically. And, and authenticity thrives in an environment of acceptance. Uh, basically, our actions can be motivated by two things, fear or desire. In, in this sense, like desire is just the natural state of moving in the way that you feel moved to move. That, that sense of desire is how I'm defining it. And, and so when we're moving from fear, we're trying to prevent certain actions from coming about. When we're moving from desire, we're simply moving from the natural state. Where does my attention go? What am I feeling moved to do? And I simply do that. Authenticity thrives when um, we're not afraid and we feel safe to do what we want. Yeah. In a, you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You 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 you're not. I mean, there's a there's a certain kind of authenticity to being in survival and taking care of stuff. I mean, you know, you're being true to where you are, and that's simply where you are. So I I can't say it's completely inauthentic to be struggling to survive. If that's where you are, you're you're doing what you can do. But this sort of higher state of creativity and self actualization that can come when you're not in survival mode you need safety and you need to not be solely focused on survival to realize yes you know as i was reading reading your book you give examples of different luminaries uh you i think you speak of nelson mandela a couple of times and rosa parks um those two names come to mind and i and i always feel like that as a barometer because whenever I refer to someone as a hero. There is a quality of, what's the word? You know, just surging, your spirit surges, rises. And that through feeling is a navigation, that that's the right direction, right? And oftentimes their actions are not of survival. They are, they are not just going beyond their survival. They're lifting everybody to go beyond survival into to a paradigm, to um, a culture or a civilization that is much more harmo- harmonious. Um, so, what was uh, what is it for you that these heroes refer to? I am um, for some reason the, the Rosa Parks example is just sort of coming to mind. So I just want like I think it's such a, a remarkable thing. Because, like, certainly for survival's sake, she would have just given up her seat because that conflict could have been a threat to her her existence. But simply refusing to give up her seat like the other passengers did and, and like, was such a profound act of simply being true to herself and being like, like, this is wrong. I shouldn't have to give up my seat for a white passenger just because of the color of my skin. That's wrong. And just feeling that inside and like staying true to that it's such a simple act but a profound act of defiance against a culture that that is discriminatory um there's something about people who are able to go against the current of 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 a society that's not in integrity, Nelson Mandela is another good example of this, you know, and the ANC and all the work that, that he did to go against the apartheid regime. 
it like for me that that those people really inspire me they're they're they might like it might be very unpopular what they're doing like a lot of people might tell them go with the status quo this is dangerous you know I and mean, Nelson Mandela could have there's several times when he was close to being killed and you know so this these kinds of the people that have you know and I don't I don't think I wrote about I don't can't remember I wrote about Mahatma Gandhi but you know he he's another example of somebody who just just the way he he stood up to the British and inspired India like that they, they, there's something about these people who are just finding that truth and standing for it and there are probably many people who maybe weren't successful in their struggles and didn't you know didn't get necessarily known for it but for me there's something heroic about staying true to yourself in the face of adversity in the face of resistance that yeah. inspires me yes and, and and greta greta thunberg you know is a one that you know young woman who's able to stand up to the leaders of the world and speak the truth and i just admire her for that as well yes. A um, couple of things come to mind. Well, what, one was, you know, um, out of the people that, that you mentioned, I don't know too much about Greta, but I remember watching her, her speech and I felt there was something, uh, maybe the anger was a little toxic. And then I, I, I read your, your mentioning and I was like, oh, I got to rethink this maybe if it comes to me, you know, look look more into how her evolution has been. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's what we're talking about, perspectives. Yeah. I, I find myself that perspectives are never complete. And as humans, we have a tendency to latch on to a perspective. Maybe it gives us a sense of comfort. Yeah. And uh, now that I'm becoming more flexible with using the correct perspective at the right time and also not you know, distrusting this tendency that one could really hold on to the perspective. Because even if you look at the visual of a perspective, it's just one angle yeah. from which you're looking. It can never capture the wholeness of the situation. Um, maybe connecting to a, a beautiful chapter that I found in your book was the miraculous and authenticity. And I think it connects very nicely with this uh, why do we have the this tendency of survival, which is justified, as you were saying, that it makes sense to have food and shelter and heat. Um, but our heart always sinks to see someone who is willing to sacrifice that for the common good or to, you know, achieve their mission, so to speak. We know this man or woman means business. Yes. You know, and we can feel it. We don't have to think. If you think it, yeah, it's the, the wrong thing to do. You know, why would I want to sacrifice my life for, I don't know, inventing something or protecting someone who might not be genetically related to my clan? But when that happens, something deep in us senses that, uh, as you highlight the feeling, the depth of the feeling that we trust. Um, So I don't know where I was going with that. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, but yes, it, it came back to me. So the miraculous... And I feel the miraculous points us back to the depth of our true identity that, in fact, is not threatened at all. And that is a powerful way that can short-circuit, so to speak, our connection with our authentic self, if, in fact, we're searching for that. Yeah. So I appreciated you you bringing that in Um because I, I've at least I've found that in my journey, only when I start to have the glimpses that I was not just a human, and that the being part of the human being is an ocean in itself. Yeah. So the more information I had about it, my persona that I was wearing was sort of peeling off naturally, rather than me yeah. trying to fight with it. You know, it's 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 interesting because we were talking about survival and survival, it it puts us away from our being. It puts us in the struggles of our ego. Um, when we're in our being, we know we're immortal. So, you know, 
time is an illusion, space, it, all these things become less relevant. So taking a stand for the truth, even if that means laying down your life from the perspective of the being, it is not as big of a sacrifice as as the ego would perceive it. Um, so th there's something about, there's so much more going on here than our minds can conceive of. Like, you know, and, and, and to, you know, like, who are you? Who am I? Really? Like, it's ineffable. I, I can't capture this. The, the depth of our being is, is beyond what we can describe in words. So this, this miraculous nature of who we really are, to me, that's part of this great mystery. It's like, authenticity for me is not defining exactly who I am. It's paying homage and bowing to the mystery of, of the great being that I, that I am in the process of embodying. And, and so are you, the, you know, the great being that you are in the process, like, and so is everyone else. And that, and that, that's where for me, authenticity and empathy, authenticity and humility, they all go hand in hand. Yes. Yeah. And I think the deeper we go in this journey of getting in contact with the mystery or the miraculous, authenticity becomes a natural expression. I believe it was a sage, popular Indian sage, uh, Ramana Maharishi, who said something, I'm paraphrasing, um, all good qualities naturally emerge from the awakened man. Uh, so that's good because it's less work. Yes, yes. Uh, but I appreciate, and I think that's why I, I highly recommend the listeners to check out your book because you have not really tried to define and pin down authenticity. It's a, more of a navigational map where wherever someone is at, you have some kind of a way whether it's through parenting or through the mannerism versus, you know, authenticity and all of those that they, they can start to bring them, bring them home. But I, I feel that if we were in fact getting in touch with the miraculous, that simplifies to some extent the process. Absolutely. I mean, in a, in a sense that the fastest way to unfold your authenticity is to connect with the vastness of your being. And, and that's always been the mission of spiritual seekers. Mm -hmm. Yes. And another beautiful thing that you said was about that the mystery is unknown and authenticity is in paying homage to that, um, to that mystery. It reminded me of a sage and a lot of meditative practices where they say that you can't really know anything whether it's my hand or a mic or a piece of, you know, a cup. And yes, I can know the utility of it and I can know how to use it, but I don't really know what it is. And I remember in my academic days when I used to be in academia, that kind of a thought or idea would be, I would be very resistant to that. I was like, what the hell it is? But even scientifically, you know, you take a cup, you want to know what the cup is, you smash it in a, some kind of a hadron collider and then you know the particles and finally you keep going down to the quantum realm and everything disappears right and uh, it totally becomes uncertain so even scientifically speaking we can know the utility of something but that doesn't mean we know at all yeah it's it's a scary place for a lot of people yeah, absolutely it's, i think i've quoted this to you before but it reminds me of the william blake poem you know where starts it with uh, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour yes powerful and in, in, encapsulate for me humility <laughs> and curiosity yeah. endless yeah curiosity. yeah it's like we can't yeah we can't even know the nature of the mic that we're recording on you know that just one thing we can't know that in, in intellectually you know, because it's it's unknowable, and that's that's why I, I feel like knowing through feeling, is is underrated, um, because when we, like I can't know who you are, like 
I could say a lot of things about you and your dedication to, you know, spirituality and meditation and your commitment to the truth. And, you know, I could point to these characteristics and qualities, but ultimately the best way to know you is to feel you. And when I feel you, I can't, I don't know, I can exactly say what I, I mean, I can throw words at it, but there's a feeling quality to who you are that I can feel. And it's, it's another way of knowing than thinking about you. And I, I, our society seems to not encourage this feeling way of knowing. And that's what I mean by empathy. And, and for me, authenticity and empathy go, go hand uh, in hand in the sense of like, authenticity is sort of that self, self-focus, me being who I am. Empathy is like, who are you? <laughs> How do I support you in being you and feeling who you are? Yes. And part of that perhaps also is feeling yourself. Exactly. You know, oftentimes when we're stuck in our head or identity, we are so disconnected from our own self. Yeah, we only have enough space. We only have as much space for anyone else as we have for ourselves. Mm-hmm. So that self-empathy, that self-ability to feel is is essential to all this. Mm-hmm. I have come to sort of respect poetry in that way, and I know you love poetry and song. And... Uh, in my recent exploration, a description I saw of poetry was that a poetry encapsulates paradoxes and also like a whole cascades of thoughts it can just encapsulate because you can unpack just like what you shared from Blake. I mean, you could write many books, mm-hmm. uh, but you can feel that something deep is encapsulated. It's, it's, it's dense, potent stuff in there absolutely um, and I think that the more we explore these paradoxes in through thought ultimately poetry becomes a natural sort of expression because it would be nonsensical if you tried to you know express them in thinking yeah yes and it, it, in a lot of ways poetry is playing with words mm-hmm. you know coming back to that child you know child playing your your we were taking words and playing with the meanings and playing with the juxtaposition and the rhythm and the cadence and how how to mm. put them together in a way that is evocative and moves people and is ineffable and powerful. Mm. It also reminds me sometimes that uh, children at a certain age are sort of musicians. I love the the sound vibrations that they create and it seems like they're in touch with some angelic realm. Absolutely. In a way um, that invokes feeling in the adults. So another uh, related and potent, I felt, topic um, that you touch on is death and the authenticity um, in death. And how, how it simplifies death as the leveler, ultimate, you know, it just brings us back to our core, mercilessly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, no way of being inauthentic in death. I don't know if it's possible. It's really sad if it is. Um, and you have also shared your father uh, a few times as somebody who really influenced you as, and was very authentic. But you mentioned the scene of his uh, death and that how it was a deep transmission of his authenticity in that moment. So maybe we can, we can connect with the subject of death and why um, that has been so um, touching for you. Yeah, yes. Excellent, excellent, excellent observation and question. Uh, my father had a, a blood clot that stopped his heart um, and he was in a, and I, I was with him when it, at the time and I started doing CPR on him and called 911, um, a friend of mine and, and uh, my nephews were there. Um, and during that time, he, his intellect was incapacitated and he was in a coma and uh, 
there was a period where we weren't sure if he was going to wake up or not, and then it became clear he wasn't. When his intellect was incapacitated, I got to know him in a whole different way because all that was there was his being. His intellect was, I mean, there was some intellect there, but very, very little compared to the brilliance that he, like as a law school professor who had a you know, vast knowledge of history and economics and politics, just could lecture on any topic at any time and could teach any section of the law. He knew he had mastery of so many areas. So in a way, like in a way that was a lot of his life mission was about that, but there was this bigger being that he, that he is that was beyond that. And so when, as he was, as he was dying, um, maybe it was a couple hours before he died, he, he did this gratitude ceremony where it, when, when somebody's in a coma, there's cycles of sleeping and waking that happen. I didn't realize this, but you know, like, so his eyes would be open sometimes. It wasn't like he was closed asleep. It's, it's kind of like they're not conscious. They're in a coma, but there's cycles of sleeping and waking, at least in the coma he was in. And I got to read his sort of micro movements. So he would, I could just tell he was like looking, I was right on his left and he started glancing at me. And there was like a subtle, like watery quality to his eyes. I could feel like this, this tearing up and I could just sense this gratitude that he had. And this like upwelling of like, thank you for everything. I mean, and it was partially for how I was being at his deathbed and all of that, but it was partially for like everything in this life, just like, and then he, he did that with my partner at the time, Heather, who was at the foot of the bed. And he, he, he did that with her. And then he did that with his brother, my uncle, um, who was at his right. And it was, it was one of the most moving acts of, of like heartfelt authenticity. It's certainly the most moving act of heartfelt authenticity that I felt from him. And Heather and I had the same, like we knew exactly what had happened. And my, my uncle at the time didn't, like he didn't perceive that. It was like maybe subtle somehow. It didn't, he didn't notice. Um, but that and then the sort of letting go process that happened, it, there's this holding on period. And then the way he, like he always, he was an atheist. He was a very like staunchly against religion, but he always loved the chants and he loved Gregorian chants and he loved the Islamic call to prayer. And, you know, like he loved the sound of that. And there was something much deeper than the intellect again. It was just something that kind of went right into his bones. And um, when, um, you know, that, that, La, la ilaha Allah. Yeah, la ilaha illallah. La, yeah, yeah, you do it better. The, la ilaha ilaha illallah. Ilaha illallah. Like, we got all of his relatives on a Zoom call all of a sudden because we were in this state where we were needing support and they all started chanting. We all started chanting that together. And as soon as we got in harmony, as soon as we got together, he, he let go his last breath. And then we, we continued on for a number of minutes just to support the process. Um, that, that time with him, there was something that happened in that transmission, like of, it's, it's like I felt all that he, all of who he was, that I, it's funny, you know, you can be somebody's son, live by their side for, you know, I lived, lived with him for 20 or I guess 18 years and then a couple more years off and on. And then, you know, had this friendship with him throughout my adult life. But there were aspects of him that remained a complete mystery. And I feel like I experienced a lot of that in, in his dying. Mm. Yeah, very beautiful and, and, and powerful. Um, yeah, I recently had another friend whose mother passed away and he was sharing with me that she was in a lot of pain battling cancer uh, and become very weak and that 
happen in a few months, three or four months. And so that was a tough testing period for her and those who were supporting her. Uh, and she also was on life support and sort of entered this coma. And he said that at this one time, she he found him to be just in a state of joy, like a childlike joy. And she indicated to him that she was ready and she did not want to be on on life support. And uh, yeah, there was something very powerful about the way it was communicated and that they knew that she was really something deeper, something authentic within her, apart from the persona of the mother and the identity, uh, knew a deeper, something much more deep that, you know, this part of the journey had concluded and joyfully, a joyful sort of return. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, beautiful teacher that you you point and I feel like often our lives become complicated when we forget that or even as a culture you know I feel like in the west death is sort of hidden right you go to is like a special place I my being here 15 years I really maybe sad to say I haven't seen really a dead body up close when back home on the Indian continent Pakistan you would have people just carrying you know, dead people every twice a week. Mm. So there's a different kind of mental adjustment, I guess, subconsciously even, that it's uh, right there. The, um, they used to have uh, skulls, like, on their desks or in the Middle Ages, like the, you know, Memento More, Remember the Dead, and, you know, there's... The, the, our, our culture is really uh, afraid, afraid of death, and we, we shield... Um, we shield others from it. I, I always felt that this, like when my father was um, in the coma and on his way to dying, my nephews and niece, at first, like the, my brother and sister-in-law uh, wanted to keep them separate from the process. And, you know, however they want to parent, I respect. But at some point I was like, I think they should see him because this is the last time they're going to, and they'll understand, they'll understand things in a different kind of way from seeing him. And I think that was a, I mean, they were maybe like, maybe they were like 12, 10 and 8 or something like that, or 13, 11 and 9, something in that range age-wise. And it was, um, it felt good for them to just see the state he was in and that he was going to die. They could tell the gravity of it just by, by being with him. It's different than hearing about it yeah yeah i think that that was a, a wise support on your part to bring them in i feel that um i've heard this from my teachers but i have come to realize that often we don't give children um their due you know they they have a sometimes a deeper sense of intelligence yeah and feeling maybe because they have just arrived from where uh, someone is returning to so even if they cannot articulate it uh, they might know a thing or two and talking about this this one story pops in my head and if you have one uh, when I was a kid because it's referencing I guess referencing how much we know I, I, when I was a kid I once I, I don't know I was maybe five or six and I saw um, an animal being slaughtered in the sort of the Muslim tradition, there's a day and people sacrifice animals. And uh, the way it was done seemed brutal, you know, the tying of the legs for people, this was a big bull. And then they took the legs and it, when it fell down and make a huge noise because it was a pretty big, strong mm-hmm. animal. And of course, resisting to uh, be killed. And uh, then as it was slaughtered, they opened the there was blood and they opened the legs and it started to kick. And so I don't remember exactly, but I I kind of knew it was very clear that this animal is in pain and this is not right what's happening. So there were these four people, including the butcher, and I asked, uh, this animal seems in, in pain. And they told me, well, you know, no, no, he's not in pain. He's actually running in the pastures of heaven or something to that effect. And I, at some level, I, part of me trusted, but a deeper level of me knew that that was bullshit. 
although I didn't have the word bullshit yeah, at the time, yeah. I knew that it was not true. More true was my experience that there was some deep suffering. And, yeah. Um, and then later, I grew up eating meat. I became domesticated. That was not even in my purview. Mm-hmm. Even though back in the region I was in, if you went to get a chicken, you usually point at the chicken, which chicken you wanted. It was a live chicken. You saw all the chickens started to panic and... Mm-hmm. then uh, the, the guy would recite some mantras and perform the sacrifice. But yeah, just, just an example of how, as children, we might have a deeper resonance with justice and injustice and suffering. And, um, but most of us get domesticated. Do you, any story comes to you in your mind? We're putting you on the spot. Yeah, I... Um... When I was a vegetarian from from 14 to 21, 13 to 20, something like that, because I didn't believe in the killing of animals. And I just as soon as I sort of started realizing, oh, they, these are animals that are living. Um, and then at some point, it, it, it seemed that my body was not getting what it needed without, without eating meat. Um, I, at some point, I uh, one Christmas, I actually took part in the slaughtering of a pig, and um, it was uh, like I we we held the pig down, and one of us took a knife and cut the cut the pig's throat, and it was like the pig was screaming for its life, and it was it was very uh, it was screaming like a person. You know, fully aware of what was happening, um, and it was chilling. I remember, you know, I, there was like a. I went back to being a vegetarian for like a month or something after that experience. It was just like, whoa, this was, you know. And then, I, as the experience got less fresh, somehow I, you know, got back to being like, okay, well, I'm still feeling the need to eat meat right now. But um, I don't know. I, I I do feel like the injustice of the way we treat animals is one of the things will will awaken to one day as a culture. I mean, some people are awake to it now, but I, I feel like as a culture, um, there's not a, a, enough respect for animals and the experience that animals have. Yes. Um, I think partly it's also because we don't see them as life and even ourselves when we become connected with this authenticity of our life essence, as you were sharing in the dying process. Yeah. Where it becomes so simple, even if you don't know, it's everything else, all the masks that we have worn yeah. would drop. Absolutely. I really have a lot of respect for the, you know, the Native American ways and they, the way they, uh, when they do kill animals, the way they, they, they just, they, it feels like there's this way of being connected to them in, in a way and the gratitude that they give and the way they see their lives is interwoven with the animals' lives in some way. Like that, that for me feels like a way of honoring and many, sorry, many indigenous cultures have that way. Yes. And uh, as a matter of fact, in certain sort of tantric traditions and maybe it's all older deep traditions, uh, the sacrifice also has, you know, oftentimes when the certain mantras or chants are done, rituals are done, it is to elevate the life force Although its body is being taken, that it elevates to a higher level, a higher consciousness. Yes. So one of your big areas of exploration uh, in your process has been through working with others and navigating authenticity in groups. And you talk about Bridging Worlds, which is, you know, the company that you founded that supports autistic adults and children to reach their full potential and their families. And uh, so how has it been, or what would you say of creating a culture of authenticity? You know, even the conversation we have had so far, it's already, of course, is touching from the level of the individual to culture, civilization, family. But are there any specific insights for entrepreneurs or people who work in a company? If we're tuned into our heart, there's there's a place in the heart can, that can discern truth. 
and falsehood. So as a child, when that person said, the bull is running in heaven, there was a way in which you could feel the truth of this animal's in suffering was being denied. You could feel it, even though you might have accepted it intellectually. You could feel it. We can feel the truth in our heart, and we can sense when somebody's being untrue. In, in a company culture, it's important that the company is run with a narrative that honors the truth. When we get distorted into the lies of our ego, we can start to live in untruth. So somebody, somebody who's lost in ego can take offense to something that is simply the other person being authentic. Like, if I simply said, I didn't like it when you said this to me, right? Like, that's not, I'm not, those aren't fighting words. Those are simply like, I just want you to know, I didn't like it when, when that happened. Um, and someone would be like, how could you say that? And that, that? They can get all bent out of shape. Like, that's a horrible offense. And, and then they're like, you shouldn't have said that to me. Like, th this type of thing can happen. So we, we need to have heart-centered conflict resolution. Where, like, I first learned this on the play yard with children. Where the, ch the fights that children would get into on the play yard, a, a lot of times I see adults sort of, dis like, shake hands and make up. Like, go go do that with your enemy right now, like, grown up. Can you do that with the person that you really don't like, the person that's offending you? Can you just kiss and make up kind of thing? Like, that. Like so I, I always respected children's conflicts. And um, so on the play yard, there'd be, you know, so-and-so pushed me, and then I hit them, and the da 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 So it's it so like, you know, I have to... The heart-centered mediation that I learned was, okay, we take turns. Well, I hear I hear one person's perspective... Then I hear the other person's perspective. And I'm listening for truth and distortion in, in that. And then I'm finding a narrative that honors the two beings that were there. I'm not looking for blame. I'm not looking for... I'm, I'm like looking for accountability, responsibility. If somebody was cruel to another, then they need to own that. They shouldn't be blaming the other. Um, but it, like basically we're finding the narrative of what knits this experience together in harmony for both people or all involved if it was more than one and and so conflict in a company needs to be handled by somebody who can hold space for that and and not be attached to any personal biases like i'm looking out for the good of of all people I don't know, King Solomon in the Bible has this, you know, was seen as this like fair and just leader. And like, you know, there are tradition, many different traditions where there were leaders that were this way, but like that, that kind of like being able to weigh out what is true and what is not true and arbitrate and, and come to a heart centered resolution together. That's, that's what's needed in companies is, is this kind of empath, this quality of empathy and this quality of listening and not allowing people who are um, discriminating against under others to continue to discriminate against them. So if one person being authentic and the other person doesn't like their authenticity and starts to spread gossip and lies about them, that that is not that's not authentic. That's that's divisive. Divisive energy is what I call the, you know, the, the attack on authenticity when somebody started, you know, and I had a lot of people in my company come, come at me and tell me I was wrong for being the way I was being. And part of it is I was in a, a very, when I first came out of the cult, I was in a very traumatized state of like looking out for people who were being manipulative. And anytime I sensed any manipulation, I would jump on it with fierceness. And, and so for me, as I've gotten more space and distance from that wound, I see that when people get lost in their ego, they're, they're suffering. And I can have more compassion for that while also still stating the truth. So for me, like, I was being true to myself in those stages right coming out of the cult. And I was true to myself in trauma. And as I've gotten more space from the trauma the authenticity and the quality of it changes. It, it takes on more peace. Yes. Yeah, I found this uh, peace sort of recurrent theme of the workplace 
quite profound of some of the statements you made. Like I think one of the things you said that if everybody is authentic, uh, that requires quite a few things. You know, if in a, in everybody has to have a heart-centered, empathic approach for allowing others to express their feeling yes. and their perspectives. And uh, what I, the two things that are coming to me is one is you you mentioned that the employees should be able to renegotiate or look at the kind of agreements they have. And usually that's not the case. You know, it's, uh, it's like just a contract, a sort of a binding contract and expressing your feelings is completely off the table. At least I don't think I have been in that organization unless you're with people who have, are authentic. Yeah and have somehow cultivated a level of awareness. And that just happens of where people are at. Yeah. But as a system, as an infrastructure, the system is, you know, has just has safety protocols, you know, protecting the employer or protecting the employee and, and not really going into expressing the truth of who you are. Um, and the second was that you had an interesting share in one situation where you actually expressed yourself in a, in a setting where people thought that you were being, they thought you were not being authentic, where you were just being very authentic and very raw, actually, and perhaps it threatened them. You're, and in this case, they were also your employees. And you took this interesting route of Rather than being the boss, you went to the HR, I believe, and you wanted to be treated as an employee. And uh, you wanted that to be addressed as if you're an employee and they were trying to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They were not uh, letting you be, be authentic, Yeah. right? And that didn't go very well. Yes. And then you had to take the position of being the employer. I think you took some time off and then you took the, the role of being an employer. And so I thought that was very profound. You were true to... You're on. You're walking the talk, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I really, I, I was very hesitant to use power over in any way at, at a certain stage in my leadership, um, and and so uh, now what what I've come to is basically, I hold to the values of the company. So if somebody falls out of the values, I call them. I point it out. I say, look. The, we value empathy here. It feels like you've fallen away from empathy in this and this way. What's going, what's happening for you? You know, and, and, and sometimes I'll start with questions and find out their take. But if I'm, the, the essence of it is these are the values. You're not in resonance with the values. Can you come back to resonance or is this not the right place for you? And so basically what, what I say and right now, the, I mean, Samantha, the CEO, is running the company. So she's in this position now. But it's like the, the leader holds the values and we don't fire anyone. But if someone wants to fire themselves by stepping out of alignment with the values and not coming back, then that's their choice. So they make choices. We say, look, like one supervisor we had was like yelling at all the staff and being very hostile to them when they were making mistakes. I'm like, OK, this is not our heart centered approach. You know, you need to change what you're doing. But then she was justifying her approach and like, look, I, we're, we're going to, you cannot be a leader here and do this. You, It's not going to work. And she kept arguing if I am like, okay, well, these are the values. You are not following the values. So do you want to stay here? Or do you want to leave? Because you're not going to be in leadership anymore. We can't have a leader tearing people down. Um, so, so the, these are the ways that we, we handle these kind of conflicts. Um, in that, at that time, I was trying to take it not as a power over, and maybe there was a way in which, I think, in retrospect, I realized as the leader, I needed to sort of pave the way with standing true to the values. And at that time, I was sort of trusting that the community could hold the values together in some way that now I, I sense that it's like the leadership needs to embody the values and hold them and then help the employees come in. So it was an interesting process to like go to the HR and 
say that I was being discriminated against and have the HR say, you can't, you can't do that because you're the, you know, you're the boss, so you can fire anyone. And I'm like, but I'm not trying to fire anyone. I'm trying to, you know, come to you as an employee who has a right to be themselves here. And um, they're like, they couldn't accept that. So then I had to be like, okay, well, if you can't, if you can't respect my authenticity as the two leaders of the company with me, then we have a problem here. And until, until we can resolve that, you know, either you're going to find a way back to accepting me as I am, or you're going to find a way out of the company because I accept you as you are, as long as you're not discriminating against me or mm-hmm. anyone else. Yes. That's a beautiful gesture to me. And maybe in, in, in this case, maybe the culture and the society we live in is, is not ready. And, you know, we're, we're shifting that. And I think that also to mention your project of heart-centered revolution, but I think that's, uh, to me, is one of the objectives is to create these kind of structures in organizations where it's heart-centered yeah. and not power-based or hierarchy-based uh, organizations. Absolutely. Beautiful. Um, authenticity, authenticity in relationships. One of the stories that I sort of was made me reflect as well was um, a romantic relationship that you mentioned uh, and how you became authentic in that relationship um, or how you claimed your authenticity. And I've I find also in your book these these stories are more powerful because they really are not some philosophy out there, which kind of sounds nice, but um, developing authenticity can rock the boat and can be a trying process. Yeah, and I think you highlight that beautifully, and you've been true to that in the workplace and in relationships. So maybe going back to to this example of romance because we you know a lot of us yeah uh, interact with that form of relationship yeah i mean a lot of ways that, that that's the story that 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 still stings the most in a way because um with my former fiance like we had this sincere love for each other that we were both in and then um after we got engaged um and i was going through this awakening um she just simply couldn't hold space for what i was going through and became very judgmental and critical of of my anger around uh, some of the abuse patterns that were happening in the cult. And um, I, you know, I did what I could to sort of pull her out of it or tell her what I needed from her in order to like hold space for me. And, and she simply couldn't do it, even though she's a trained therapist and, you know, trauma therapist, even like she didn't have the space to hold the extremeness of what I was feeling. And so I, I remember I had, this, I, I had this realization that I was going to need to end the relationship. And I, it was the hardest realization, like one of the hardest realizations I've ever had because it's like the last thing I wanted to do, but my heart knew it needed to be done. And I, I, I had a conversation with her where it's just like, look, I can't be with you anymore if you're going to keep hating me. And hating meant judging condemning and trying to get me to be different around how I was moving through my process of healing post the cult. Um, Because I was trying to fight to get these people out and she didn't want me to do that. She wanted me to just move on peacefully. And I'm like, they're like my family. I can't, can't give up on them. And so she said, I'm not hating you. Like, I feel it. I can tell, I can sense this. And then she went into this like collapse state and kind of apologized. And then um, I just said like, yeah, my body can't, I can't be, go on being lovers with you with this kind of toxicity, but I still love you. Like I, you know, like, like let's stay in connection. Let's talk, but like, maybe this can, maybe we can move through this. I don't know. But right now it seems like we need to pause everything and like we just focus on our friendship. And then like she got home and the next day she wrote me this letter that was just like, I had asked her, like, what is it that you hate about me so much? Like, what? And so then she wrote this letter, everything she loved and hated about me, but the, the what she hated about me was such accusation, like false accusations, not like her open-heartedly sharing 
her resentments that she's been holding back from me. It was like her sharing these judgmental truths as if this was who I was. I'm like, oh my God, you've, you've missed me and who I am. And, and so then like at that time, I kind of went to war with her in this way of just being like, no, this is the truth of who I am. You're out of integrity with you know, me and yourself. And I, I hold true to the love that we have. I, and this is not loving. This is, you know, infighting. And like, like, because I'm going through a difficult experience, now you're going to blame me for, like, getting mad at yelling at people who are, you know, trying to get me back in the cult. They're not accepting my truth. Like, I'm not judging them. I'm not condemning them. I'm not, you know, hurting them. I'm just speaking my truth forcefully. And... um you know, it's the same thing with her. I was simply speaking the truth of my heart and she took it as like, as like an attack on her ego. I'm like, I'm not here to attack your ego, but if you're hurt by the truth, then let's look at that together. I'm not trying to hurt you. Mm -hmm. um, but that there, there's, I think that, that a lot of times we grow together, we grow apart in relationships. And we were in this growing apart phase and I was hoping we could, grow through it together but that's not the way it went mm -hmm. yeah yeah that was a sort of a powerful example of staying true to who you are and i think you have made this association throughout the book but you also mentioned this being yourself in parenting yes right that if you start if your actions are to please every desire of the child or to sort of punish them uh, it's best instead of doing that it's best to feel yourself of what your needs are and what the needs of the child are and that spontaneously should result in the best kind of parenting and I had to think about that and that, that makes sense because one thing you said is if you don't set a good example if you're not feeling ourselves and are not connecting to ourselves or if you're sacrificing then the children were also giving them the role model, right? And they they are going to be doing repeating the same thing. So, yeah, and in, in, in my own relationships, I, I sort of resonate with um, where we try to form people, change people, or shoot them, and they're shooting us. And it's just a very heavy, it's a compromise at the expense of authenticity yeah. and our potential. Yeah, I mean, in romance, letting each other be, like letting you be you, letting me be me, you know, is, is, the, way, is the way it needs to be. And in parenting, we need to let ourselves be ourselves. Like, we can't conform to the kid's behavior as if that's, like, they should tell us how to be. We need to be true to ourselves. Sometimes that means setting limits and saying no. Other times that means being empathic and allowing them to do a little more than you might be inclined to do. But just, it's it's like staying true to yourself. It's, it's such a delicate moment-to-moment -moment dance of listening and sensing what is best here. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah, as you said, it's a delicate dance also because at any point we are at a certain level of our evolution and to have the discernment of what is an authentic expression versus what is an unconscious tendency. Yeah. So one of the things that, Adam, you mentioned is the revolution of the heart. I think you also you talk about that in heart-centered revolutions. What is the heart-centered revolution? The revolution of the heart, you know, in, in a way, it's 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 making a culture that works for everyone. The revolution of the heart in an individual is connecting with your heart and being true to yourself. When it's, you know, in a, a dyad or two people relationship, it's about creating a space where each of us can be true to ourselves and each other. So the revolution of the heart is creating cultures that work for everyone in the culture, one relationship at a time, one connection at a time. So really, I think also going against the grain of separation, of separation of groups and classes and... Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's based on connection, you know, and it's based on 
everyone having a right to be who they are, and it's based on equality and honoring the human dignity in each person. And, you know, even beyond the human world, you know, honoring animals, honoring plants, honoring the mineral world, honoring all beings. Beautiful. So in your work on authenticity, as you've been building this work, it's been a few years, what are uh, some of the new or recent refinements, developments, maybe in the last year or so that... Uh, if something comes to your mind where you feel like there has been a shift in your understanding or a refinement of how you are sharing this? I think, you know, a lot of this was forged through trauma. And so when I first experienced the trauma, I had more anger in response to it. So what I find is, the you know, with uh, Walt, Walt Whitman says, with the key of softness, unlock the locks with a whisper. And I think that's where I'm, where I'm heading is finding a softer way while being just as true to me. I love it. Yeah. So maybe a final question would be authenticity is good for all, you say in your book, and that makes sense to me. How could you draw a picture for us how if everyone in a society, in a workplace culture was authentic, why is that a win-win for everybody to be like that? In, in a company, um, the more information the leadership has about what is actually happening in the company, the more intelligent the leadership is. In a traditional company, everyone's holding back the truth, any negative truth, about how they're feeling, about where the company's going. In a heart-centered community, the leadership wants to know what everyone feels and thinks about the organization so that can inform the direction it's going. Uh, it's, so it's, it's, it's like optimizes the intelligence and also the productivity because anyone who's being authentic is going to be creative because they feel like they can be themselves at work. So then they're gonna naturally bring their creative talents more to the table. So it's, it's, you're creating a culture that works for everyone, that, that where everyone can be themselves and feel comfortable and safe so then naturally the company will thrive. Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful vision and maybe a, a paradigm that we're, we're entering in where we can yeah. all, all have uh, what I like to think as creativity as a human right. Absolutely. It, it takes leadership being willing to check their own egos and, and really look at things honestly. Most leaders cannot hear feedback that's negative about themselves. And that stands in the way of a heart-centered culture. Because as soon as you tell me, hey, you know, you really didn't have my back there, or you were lacking empathy there, or whatever it is, and you say, how could you say that about me? You know, <laughs> I'm gonna punish you, I'm gonna pay you less, or whatever, whatever, you know, there's consequences. I'm gonna give you less privileges now. You know, like, I'm gonna use my power to oppress your freedom to speak the truth as you see it, and now, I've told you, you can't be honest with me. So now yes. next time you have honest feedback, you're not going to say it because I'm not going to hear it. So the, the leaders, the leadership's willingness to listen to feedback without getting defensive. As Robert Frost says, like I think he says, education is the ability to hear anything without losing your temper or your self-esteem. <laughs> Lovely. I think that, um, you know, the, the example that, that you gave of going to the HR as an employee, how many of um, CEOs or people who form companies would be willing to do that, that in a way, if your ego, your identity is just tied in, in an organization or whatever that you're building or doing, then such a, such a gesture is not possible and is seen as a threat. Absolutely. But if you're tied in the heart, if you're tied into the heart, into your being, and you know that it's just a role that you're playing, then things become much more flexible. And I think oftentimes it's even difficult for us as, I've, at least I find it difficult for myself to visualize what such a civilization could look like. Uh, but at least at the level of the feeling that if everybody feels good yeah. and feel that they are free to express 
um, and be honest, then how then it must be something good. That's what I trust. Ab- it has to be good. Absolutely. You know, it, it is a very idealistic notion that you could create a company that can work for everyone or a family culture that can work for everyone and or a world that can work for everyone even more idealistic. And a lot of people just simply think it's not possible. But it, it takes a level of self-awareness in, in a group to do this. It takes a, particularly the leadership, but also there takes a, a high degree of self-accountability and self-responsibility to agree to not blame. And when we do get lost in blame, come back to the truth of our heart, come back to the truths of empathy and love. So it, it can be done. I've seen it happen in Bridging Worlds. I've seen it happen in Heart Centered Revolutions. But... There are people who would take a stand and say what we're doing is wrong because they don't understand the the truth of empathy and love. And as soon as they lock into judgment, they close their mind and heart. And so those people, I you know, one day I hope to find a way of reaching those people more effectively. But right now, what I can say is this work will work for anyone who wants to open their heart. And anyone who wants to be connected with their heart, truly, not just intellectually, but experientially, like I have a way to help them lead a family from their heart, lead a company from their heart, or lead their own lives from their heart. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's an incredible vision, and I'm so glad to to know you. That's what my aspiration as well is with, you know, sharing these new potential paradigms that are heart-centered and centered in our being and uh, thank you really for writing this book and making this uh, sort of a work of your life so to speak and yeah looking forward to collaborating with you and having more conversations excellent Kanan thank you so much I really appreciate being on and to the listeners uh, we'll put the links in the show note and you're probably seeing the book a few times on the screen if you're watching this on YouTube Please check out this book, uh, leave a review on Amazon or wherever you, you find it. And I hope that by reading this book, we get a step closer to our true selves, our authentic selves. Thank you. Thank you.